Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the seventh annual Isaiah Berlin Day in Riga. We take great pride and satisfaction in joining you in paying tribute to Sir Isaiah Berlin, philosopher, historian of ideas, political theorist, educator, and essayist, and the ideas and values expressed and defended by him, pluralism, tolerance, and individual liberty. Latvia has always been a country where most clever ideas come from women. However, in this case, it was four wise men, Henry Hardy, Robert Cottrell, Niels Mojniks, and Andris Alkmanis, who seven years ago got together and planted the seed of what has now become an debated celebration of liberal thought and intellectual curiosity. Isaiah Berlin Day has always varied in its range of events and formats. This year, we are presenting you an Oxford-style Baltic Youth debate in cooperation with the debate association Quota Duoma. It will be followed by an episode by the BBC Two late-night show about Isaiah Berlin with introductory remarks by David Herman, producer of the film. And finally, the annual Isaiah Berlin Memorial Lecture by Henry Hardy, editor of the writings of Isaiah Berlin. This day could not have happened without the support of a longtime partner and friend of the Isaiah Berlin Day, namely the representation of the European Commission in Latvia. A partner who helps spread the writings and ideas of Isaiah Berlin in Latvia is also online journal Satori LV. And the news internet portal Delphi helps us to reach out with a live broadcast. Thank you to all supporters. If at some time this afternoon you are looking into your smartphones, we are certain that you will be tweeting at hashtag Isaiah Berlin. Please do so. Finally, before I give the floor to the debaters, I would also like to sincerely thank my colleagues at the Foundation Duos, Irina Kuznetsova, Leo de Prusse, and Ilse Klimaszewska. Uh, they have put their hearts and souls into making this event happen. And now I would like to invite uh, the debaters uh, from Estonia and Latvia, Tony Skuls, Karl Martin Kerberg, Helmut Saune, Liva Andersone, and Edmund Saperitis. Thank you, and have an inspiring afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to open this debate. As you can see, we deviated from the classical Oxford-style format. There are only two people in the government side. It is due to the, one of the members of our team, like one of the organizers of Latvian Debate Association, Martin Schweivers, has had a problem and couldn't be here. So what we'll basically do, we'll have uh, seven-minute speeches each, and I'm going to present you with the two speeches uh, to basically replace what uh, Mar Martin was supposed to do. So we have, just for everyone to know, we have the government on this side which defends the motion that we prepare a joint European Union foreign policy over the status quo. And then we have the opposition uh, arguing against that. So yeah, we have seven minutes of speeches. You also see the teams raising questions uh, once in a while and just to have more of uh, interactions. Uh, just to be clear, no questions during debate are allowed from the audience. Of course, we can have more discussions after that. So, without further ado, I'd like to open the case why this House prefers a joint EU foreign policy. First of all, in our position, we see European Union as a magnificent project with all its flaws, but still, it's a project that's basically based on the principles of open society. We're coming together and following your ideals, such as human rights, individual liberty, democracy, and other values, has become more important than the interests of few sovereign states. We want to keep this development going also in the field of foreign relations and keep this integration, and we basically see uh, this is the best possible future. I'm going to talk to you about two main points. 
Why these values are important for everyone, that they are like better represented in the global stage, and the second point is going to be uh, more concentrated about how this kind of like a joint EU policy would make uh, European Union realize its full potential and therefore bring more benefits to the world. But first of all, what do we mean by joint EU policy? We don't necessarily see this as like a one-time decision. We basically see that the current uh, structure, which is European External Action Service, would basically get more and more influential, like uh, see a both increase in its powers and the resources, and that would be combined with a decrease of national foreign relations departments, which would generally, after some moment of time, be re uh, fully replaced with this European Ex External Action Service, which would represent all European countries in the foreign relations issues. <clears throat> the first point about the values. Why do we believe such a joint European uh, foreign policy would defend the values of what I mentioned, human rights, democracy, um, basically uh, liberty, and other the values that the EU is based for? We see that this is the part of the European identity. This is what something that the European Union is based for, and therefore we see while you look at the foreign policies of separate countries, sometimes you see that the selfish interests are the ones that take over some sort of uh, interests of the better world or something like that. We see that once we have a structure where we have many national states with their own selfish interests, basically these selfish interests are then put aside in terms of more long-term interests in the, in, 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 instead of like the interests that would be better for the whole world. Yes? Could you give us an example of what kind of selfish interests are so, so bad that we should have such kind of a joint policy? Well, we see not only that the selfish interests themselves are bad, but especially bad are the selfish interests which are short-sighted. For example, as some European countries have basically said we shouldn't uh, get any sanctions to the Russia because we have business to do with them. Like we earn some like extra money uh, because of these businesses. For example, uh, both the Baltic states and other countries have political powers that could say, well, we shouldn't like push that hard for any like reforms and changes in Russia in order not to hurt ourselves in the short term. However, in my second like speech, I'll also explain how this is better for the countries in the long term, uh, even like uh, taking into account their own like selfish interests. Yeah, so basically we see that um, these values, we are like feel uh, strong to say these are the kind of the values that we should have more discussed. These values should have more influence in the global setting. And we believe a joint EU policy can do so by making these values uh, primary over the, like, uh, over the selfish values of the national governments. And the second point is continued, how we actually realize the full potential of the European Union in its power. So basically what we see here, European Union is a huge structure with a huge political, military, and economic power. However, the political power is the part that's mostly been missing. We see the reasons for that, uh, in namely the case that this is the part that is least integrated. This is the part where there's more differences between the states. These like kind of like uh, differences in, in, in opinions leads to indecisiveness. We've seen cases where this has led to like very bad outcomes. We've seen like a massacre going to almost genocidal scales in Bosnia, where European action has not been like sufficient and decisive enough. We've seen the same happening later in the Kosovo, where the action uh, led by the NATO and not by the European Union that much was, could also have been more decisive and like uh, made the European interests defended much better. We see the same happening in the relations with Russia, where currently there are no kind of like a joint European policy against the quite aggressive Russian policy against the European countries. We see that as a problem. We see that once we have a four more efficient structure that has all the resources in place to respond to the threats as they come, that becomes first, faster, and second, more efficient, with the joint intelligence, etc. we see that these, uh, these European interests then can be defended much better. And we see that as a place 
that the European Union should take. It should take a far larger share of the political power in the international arena than it currently does. This is something that has been based on its huge economic and uh, military power, as well as I mentioned, and we believe this lack of political power in the international arena is something that hurts both the world at large, because we believe these values that the EU stands for are good for the world, and it's been especially bad for the European Union and its member countries. I also continue that case in my second speech, but basically I want to say, because these values that the European Union stands for are so important, and because by having a joint EU foreign policy, we make defending those values far more efficient, far more stronger, we believe that EU foreign policy is the way to go, and we would like to ask you to defend that as well. Thank you. The ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to open for the opposition on this motion that we need joint policy foreign affairs in the EU. What we just heard was a nice idea, uh, in all in all. But what we are here to tell you about is how those values are not necessarily meaning that we should give up our foreign affairs and go into some um, medium compromise of what we would think the average foreign affairs should look like for the European Union, because that is exactly where it's going to go about. And uh, while Edmunds failed to address an actual workings of how that would work and how that would be much better, instead of telling you about the whole ideal of what we're going here, we're saying that EU should actually stick to what it's good at, and it's actually reached an interesting place where it's trying to see its limits, and what is working, and what is not working, and what is the way forward, and what we're not going to go forward. And we believe it should stay. But first off, just some points of rebuttal. They're saying that, you know, that democracy and human rights are something that should be above sovereign state interest. Uh, however, what is not really mentioned here, that sovereign state interest is the sole reason why sovereign states exist, right? To def defend and provide for the citizens within that country who are actually gotten together based on shared values, based on shared views on how things should be done one way or another. Of course, there's internal debate even in those countries. However, this is the, the society that they have come together and decided that this is our representation, this is how we're going to be, and this is how we're going to get the best outcomes for us. It's basic survival, and we don't think that there's anything inherently wrong. Furthermore, there wasn't really an effective harm shown as in why these selfish policies lead to something really bad except for, well, their short term. Uh, without really explaining what exactly the short term is, uh, where are the benefits, what is the bad things that are going to happen. So we're really looking forward to that in our next speech. Um, we're also saying that European Union is not uh, a military union and therefore a lot of things that they mentioned well, were not done or were done to a less extent which would fit better the, what the values are promoting. And the European interest would be better represented, I think my partner in his speech will explain how, how actually it's not going to work that way and I'm also going to touch upon that in explaining the differences among the countries and why that wouldn't work too much. Now first off, our view on common policies, we think that, you know, um, we think that the European Union has come a long way. It started out as a let's have peace and nice trade amongst a couple of countries and now it has gone to 28 countries union with political views and much, much more than, you know, just let's not fight with each other. We think that's a great accomplishment and it's probably uh, saved us a lot of trouble for the last years that it's been existing. We think that peace, democracy, trade and migration is actually in the freedom of migration is what the European Union primarily deals with and we think that should stick to it. Um, the same inter internal independencies and sovereignties have been uh, given up in this union in order to get some certain benefits. For example, we um, give up some, we actually accept common, common, uh, common uh, legislation, we actually implement certain things because we want to see free travel in Schengen zone, right? This is a benefit that you get for uh, doing something else. So it's like a give and get relationship. Whereas when it comes to foreign policy, it's not really that clear cut. Uh, first of all, not every time you make a foreign policy decision, you actually get something back instantly, or at least you cannot materialize it for a long time, or ever for that matter. And therefore, this is a very ambiguous place to go to when it comes to foreign affairs, right? Um, and the EU, EU has actually expanded 
um, expanded so much, it's got a lot, a lot of countries in there to consider. And Europe has historically been a very diverse place, and we celebrate diversity, we want diversity, and we think that the union as it is right now uh, is actually the ultimate solution on how to maintain this relationship while making European, pan-European relationships to an extent not a foreign affair anymore, it's to an extent actually an internal affair of a lot of these countries, but not to meddle with things like national identity, we have 28 uh, languages at least, uh, and, and we're, we're respecting the sovereignties of the states because that is the foundation of this union that we respect the sovereignty of those nations, right? Um, and we think that this will undermine that, yes? Do you think the main reason is how foreign policy actually achieves something it's far easier to do that once you're a part of a big union rather than a small national state. Okay. I mean, in theory, that would probably make a lot of sense, but I'm just going to delve into how that's not really the case in our, in our scenario. First of all, I would like to just grasp over that foreign affairs, we just don't mean sanctioning dictators in some remote corners of the world. It actually means decisions about expanding the union. It actually means providing aid or military interventions in countries that are not our own. Um, there are recognitions of countries, there are securing of external supplies from countries that are not us, and these are a lot of, lot of decisions that actually qualify as foreign affairs. It's a very complex matter for that thing. Now, when we actually to have, trying to get together 28 countries with a really different background, different values to an extent, I mean, we've tried to mediate them, but we haven't, you know, become the United States of Europe yet, and I doubt that we should be, and I think we will not we should not pursue that. First of all, we have geographic diversity. We are looking at a really wide geographic area. And we have several blocks of countries with conflicting or um, different things. We're looking at neighboring countries like Russia for the Eastern Bloc countries. And then there are Mediterranean Sea countries which are actually far more concerned with North Africa and Middle East affairs because that impacts them more than whatever uh, Russia decides to do on its own end, right? So there are conflicting things that could be considered, and that leads to priority differences. Um, there are priority differences, for example, because we believe that this threat, uh, for example, for Russia, is the far most important thing from external affairs policy, whereas a lot of countries think it's the, actually the, the, the developments in the Middle East, which actually provide us a lot of immigration that the countries can handle, whereas we see the threat to Ukraine as an indirect threat to the Baltic countries' sovereignty. Countries like France, like Italy, like Greece, like Spain, actually are thinking more that they're not sustainable because of the influx of immigration, and they're actually interested in Middle East affairs. So there is, there is a priority difference, and it's not easy to come to a middle ground of what's actually in the priority list, because what we're looking at is there's actually differences in countries, and I'm going to get to that. But I think that um, because of the complex um, built of, this, uh, of our nation, uh, it's a bit difficult to do that. Um, there are countries that are willing to forego trade with Russia. We are for willing to say, okay, let's slow down economy, we don't care, we think this is the right thing to do. Whereas there are countries which are looking at, well, we're not going to have any gas or electricity because we're shutting down our uh, nuclear power plants, but we have nothing in place, like Germany, uh, who are actually really interested in not, not damaging the relationships beyond, uh, beyond that with Russia. And there are, these are really hard decisions. I think it's really easy to stand there and point a finger when you don't have to make that decision. But these are the people who actually make, have to make that decision for their people because those are really real problems and that are not going to be solved overnight. And, and it's really difficult to judge which is important. And this is why we think it's really important for those countries to just come up and decide for their own what is better for the, for the people within their own sovereign nation. And the people are actually more supportive of that than some generic middle foreign affairs policy that they will not see a benefit from or will feel that they're misrepresented. Because there's the big countries which decide and have a lot more leverage than the countries that are smaller and we have a lot of those, right? And even if we have a lot of those small countries, they will still feel underrepresented and they will resent the EU and that is undermining the EU itself, which we don't think is beneficial at all. What we think is there's actually different implications. For example, if you take Kosovo case, there are five countries within the EU who still not recognize Kosovo as an independent country, whereas 23 have. Um, Baltics sympathize with this country saying, well, they're just like us, right? So they, we should say that we should support them. And we understand that because we're coming from pretty much a similar background. However, there are countries like Spain, 
uh, who have not recognized it. Because the implication of them recognizing Kosovo would mean that they would actually have to um, lay, that there is actually a legitimate claim for Catalan to actually break and claim autonomy. Uh, similar cases we have in Slovakia, where there's a Hungarian minority, we have Cyprus with Turkish minority, and these are setting precedents for those countries within. And that is, under, uh, that is they seeing as a threat to their internal stability. And if we have these kinds of clashes within those countries that are within the EU, we're actually undermining the stability of the EU itself. And therefore, these kinds of affairs, which are really based on our historic, our, our national, or otherwise shaped, because Europe is a result of a lot of wars, which we cannot forget, not in 20 years, not in 100 years, it's going to take a lot of time. But we don't think that eliminating foreign affairs and making a joint average policy is going to solve that, is going to cater to that, or make the EU pros prosperous. We think that is the line where they should stay out and let that happen and make those people can pursue it, because the internal affairs are the drivers there to make external decisions. And if those are not enough, then we have to consider that it has been justified, and therefore we're proud to oppose. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank Leva for this speech. It actually sets the floor very well for my speech, which is going to talk about how the interests of uh, separate states are actually overlying with the long-term interests of the European Union. Especially if you look at the long term, I'll prove you that basically this is the best decision that each separate state can take as well. What we are provi provided here from the opposition is basically that we have too many differences in opinions, and we basically agree to that. Obviously, there are currently differences in opinions. This is one of the reasons why the this is one of the reasons of the current inefficiency of like the EU policy, that these differences are actually taken into this international arena. These differences cancel out each other. These differences is what makes the EU common policy inefficient. However, what they fail to prove is how these differences can be overcome. They mention that some of the EU European countries don't see Russia as a threat. What we believe, if we have a common discussion across all the European countries, where basically everyone brings their own kind of like political agenda and we are forced to make one solution, we basically see the most rational, the most well-argumented uh, decision would come out of these discussions. And that decision, we believe, is that we should take Russia into account as a potential threat. What we get as an outcome is an official policy to address that possible threat. And that's what we see as a benefit for, for these countries. Now, they also say that this would lead to instability. No, thank you, not now. This would also lead to instability in kind of like European Union as a whole. We see perhaps, like as each decision, like uh, basically changes the status quo, has this potential. But we see we can do this like carefully enough to actually have the benefits first outweigh the harms. And therefore, we believe that most of the countries, in a large sense, at least in the EU, are led by rational politicians. And if they see like, benefits that would come out of this policy, they should also agree that they should put their differences aside. They also then tell you about how sovereignty is something that like, the countries like it's the, sovereignty is the main, most important part of these, like the country's most important value, etc. However, we don't see how in foreign relations, sovereignty is something that can be preserved in any case. Because what you actually want to get from the foreign policy, you want to get some sort of the outcome. You want to get your opinion be heard in the international arena. What stands for the most of the small countries currently in EU, that they can't actually achieve that if they voice their opinions separately. As I'll prove in my point, it also stands for the larger European countries, such as Germany, France, and the United Kingdom, that their opinions won't be heard in the international arena anymore. And therefore, it's in their best interests to actually have the kind of like uh, positions they want to present in the international arena to be part of a larger union, which in this case is obvious, their obvious choices being the part of European Union foreign policy and always align their opinions. And therefore, they would have the most effect their opinions being told out. And um, yes, of course. Okay, so for example, how long for all European Union kind of, you know, stands on Kosovo? 
Well, we believe that once this European External Action Service, which I mentioned in the beginning, is established, it basically has all the strategic resources to make decisions in these kind of like extreme cases itself. Well, we believe that's what the most like reasonable case for United Foreign Policy is, that you don't uh, make discussions anymore once the question is uh, really uh, important, urgent, and etc. Whatever where you do have discussions is to define these kind of like the strategies and also like discuss how that would actually, um, actually, yeah, I can mention that basically once you make the long term strategies of what our policy should be in terms of like this or that scenario happens in the Middle East or etc., then you take these decisions into account. But whenever some action happens, you already have a decisive force that can take the action. Okay, and the last point where they basically said they are asking for the harms of the current status quo. I already mentioned in my first speech that currently there's unrealized potential for a European impact on the policy. This is basically created by these huge inefficiencies where the differences in the countries' opinions cancel each other out and this voice of Europe cannot be heard. We basically see these as a good enough harms, but we can also mention such things as like a loss of part of Moldova because we couldn't actually tackle the uh, aggressive Russian foreign policy. We could also like mention uh, instability of the Middle East because of lack of strategic vision for the common Europe. What, what do we want to see in the Middle East? We also saw this indecisiveness in the case of Syria, where because of that we actually uh, have uh, come to the situation where we have an Islamic State which currently undermines all of the values the European Union stands for. We believe all of this could be avoided if we had a more decisive structure. And now for the second part, how it's actually so good for all of the separate states as well. I actually sketched that out already, but basically what we see currently happening, happen, happening uh, in the process of globalization, we see more and more superpowers coming to the international stage. One of them is China, another one could be India. We could also see another superpowers coming into this stage, and basically uh, we can see there's a huge threat for mar marginalization of European op opinion there. The threat is basically uh, described, what, the, what I already mentioned to you, this cancelling out of opinions, what we see that most of these new superpowers are um, why they are so harmful for this European opinion. Because in most of these countries, they don't have an active civil society. They don't have this much of like discussion culture. These values which we all stand for and which we discuss here are not that much present in their government uh, positions. What we want to see is all the interests of European countries still be present at that level. And for that to happen, we need to avoid this marginalization of the Europe uh, uh, within the international stage. The second point I want to stress out here is what I mentioned already, that long-term interests of separate states overlie with the interests of the like, uh, European Union. Basically, we already like, mentioned how in discussions you basically get the best kind of like, the strategies that there are for this European region. For example, I believe there's no doubt that like more stability in the Middle East, in the north of Afri Africa, and basically also sub-Saharan Africa, would be something that's beneficial for the European Union because more prosperity in these regions would also bring more prosperity in the Europe as a whole. We also see the stronger stance against uh, Russia, Iran, and other like powers which are uh, fighting for the influence or the margins of Europe would be something to, like the stronger influence would be something that would benefit all of these states. Well, we see these short-term interests led by the politicians, sometimes like elected for just a, um, short, short terms in the four years, could be that we should avoid the policies that would be best in these uh, outcomes. They would want to have a different kind of policies, but however we see in the long term, each of the country would benefit from a stronger Europe. They would also benefit from this stronger stance, they would benefit from the stability across the region, and therefore we see that this is the case where you have to put your separate opinions aside and come together for greater good for the long more long-term prosperity. We also see that in the case of, for example, climate change. The European Union is famous for setting quite, um, uh, quite strategically important goals in tackling the climate change. This is one of those cases which we believe there will be many more in the future, where you have to solve environmental problems, where you have to solve uh, conflicts in other cases, where if each state um, 
was working in its own selfish interest, we won't achieve the outcome that's best for all. And we believe with these points I proved you that it's both best for the whole world and best for each of the country within the European Union to leave their interests aside, come together, discuss the long-term strategic vision, and stick to that and have a stronger European, uh, joint European foreign policy. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, two questions on the table at this moment. Firstly, do we want a European Union? Do we want to live in a European Union which has a common foreign policy? And the second question is, is that achievable? Is that achievable that tomorrow or, or, or like in five years we will have a joint foreign policy that all countries will follow and everyone will be happy? The team proposition basically tells you that the European Union is not the homogeneous superpower and the only way to fix that is to enforce a common foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, if this is the only way to do that, then we shouldn't try to create that homogeneous superpower. Because we in team opposition believe that the European Union should be for the member states' interests, not vice versa. I would like to start off by refuting some of their points and then talking about two things. Firstly, why these decisions under joint foreign policy uh, that, that are going to be made are going to be ineffective and extremely slow and not very responsive at all. And secondly, tackle the point of view of a regular European Union citizen and how this policy would, uh, would actually impact regular people uh, living in their states. So the first thing we heard from them was that we already have some common policies in the European Union. For example, you know, we, we have policies about common, uh, uh, common human rights laws, we're already tackling climate ch change together, and like a common foreign policy is the next logical step to take. We believe this is a rather different case. My previous speaker already explained, I'm going to give you another reason. Foreign policy is different from other policies because all the member states agree that human rights, for example, or, or uh, global warming are extremely important matters. And th these are matters that need to be fixed in one kind of way. However, by far not everyone agrees what we should do in the conflict of Ukraine and Russia, for example. So that's why you cannot enforce a common foreign policy. The, sh the second thing we heard was that we should prioritize long-term goals over more pragmatic issues. But ladies and gentlemen, we believe that the state's responsibility, first and foremost, is to tackle issues that affect their citizens the most. So for example, security threats, and then uh, come all the other issues, such as long-term uh, uh, economic cooperation, for example. They gave us an example about Russia. Uh, they told us that Germany prioritizes economic goals over sanctioning Russia, and with a joint foreign policy, we could tackle that, sanction Russia better, and get, uh, get them under control. But that's actually going to also happen under their model. Even if we would achieve a joint foreign policy, then Germany is still going to decide everything because we're just so dependent on them. For example, they have huge economic power. We depend on them because of trade relationships. The whole southern Europe has to follow Germany's rule because otherwise they will end up in bankruptcy. So therefore, even if we're talking about extreme cases like Russia, uh, in, in Ukraine, we're still not going to benefit from that. So the last thing we heard for them, we uh, heard for them was that if we don't implement this common foreign policy, then EU will become weaker compared to other, super, uh, other emerging superpowers, for example, China and India. Well, firstly, we already showed you why a joint foreign policy will destabilize the Union and therefore make it harder to compete with other superpowers. But furthermore, even if the EU would become stronger, then these big players like Germany, like France, they will win big, and the other smaller guys like Baltic states, for example, they will miss out. So, like, eventually, uh, like all the member states will not benefit definitely from this plan. I would like to expand our case by, talk, by talking about two things. Firstly, so why uh, the, these policies will be ineffective. Secondly, the impact on the citizens. Let's start with the first point. Why this is hampering responsiveness? 
So a joint policy is a compromise basically by definition because we have different countries with different needs, different priorities, different uh, outlooks. So for example, uh, Netherlands is not threatened by Russia, Baltic states uh, li like have a border with Russia, and like Southern Europe's most prevalent issue are the North African immigrants. And now already the fact that it is a compromise is bad enough because no one you know, will get what they want entirely, big countries will outdraw small ones, or it could even happen vice versa, or we will have one, like one major big player like France or Germany that will decide everything. So, it, it, conclusively, uh, we can say that it's going to be a bad compromise. But even if we assume that best possible decisions will be made, then all member states will still have to negotiate with each other and agree on some kind of a final uh, strategy, right? So this foreign policy brings most impact at times of crisis or a sudden change of environment, when quick actions have to be taken. And the joint foreign policy would make it harder to come up with a homogeneous action plan and make it even harder to implement that plan efficiently. So that's exactly what we saw in Ukraine. And this is a worse situation than having many countries decide immediately based on their specific needs because often imperfect actions are better than taking no action at all, especially when we're talking about very turbulent times and we have to make really quick decisions and solve the issue. The impact of this, in a second, is that the European Union will always be late with their important decisions and in a worse position compared with other superpowers, both as a union and individual member states. Yes. Could you comment on the point, in the case of the Ukrainian conflict, it was like Katrin Ashton that was there like, just a few days after the riot started. The problem was not that she didn't react fast enough, the problem was she didn't have enough power then to actually tackle the issue. No, we're not saying that. What we saw was that Germany, for example, wanted to maintain its good economic uh, trade relations with Russia. However, some Baltic states wanted to be more aggressive and try to solve that issue. Now, if the EU would, would have a joint foreign policy, then big players like Germany would outrule the Baltic states and, and Russia would get actually like, uh, like no influence uh, from the more aggressive side. But now we're talking about the impact on the citizens. So in the European Union, all people should be treated equally, and that's why we have, for example, free movement of labor, uh, students, and we have some kind of universal human rights. And that it's extremely important for people to feel that they are significant, and that they are cared about, and that someone listens to them. Now, although foreign policy might not be the most important aspect of politics that people care about the most, it is one of the most visible areas of state action because these decisions affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And therefore, if people see that they have virtually no control over the country's foreign policy, they feel alienated and abandoned. And they have a reason to feel so, because Team Proposition's plan actively undermines their right to identify themselves as, as a nation. So for these reasons, I am extremely happy to oppose this motion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that uh, one of the underlying questions regarding this debate, in which now my task is to sum up what was, what was said by the previous two speakers of my team against what was said by, uh, said by the team opposition and, and to show that why, why our, our arguments are better, it seems to me that one of the, the underlying uh, questions uh, in this debate is uh, whether the agency that is national sovereign states are uh, are, are, still, are still something uh, that, that we, should, we, should, we should hold in a really high value in such an area that is foreign affairs. And what we believe really is that, uh, uh, and which is quite, quite a risky, risky thing to say in front of any audience in, in, any, in, in any European, European state still, and which is also something which I'm not sure whether uh, Sarah Saya, if he was here, would fully agree, no, agree on. However, what we are saying is that uh, national sovereign states, as they currently still exist in the European Union and in other places of the world, are a, are a passing phenomenon both 
because of the emergence of common values between various states and also because of political pragmatic efficiency that is more achieved by huge powers and by unions and, and by united resources. Uh, and that, that is the reason why I believe that uh, uh, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the future the world would be in a much better state if, uh, if European Union would emerge as a power in which uh, the agencies and uh, the, uh, the abilities of the national states regarding foreign affairs are reduced. And, uh, uh, and we believe that the, the main reason why national states exists in the first place, which is uh, uh, pres preserving the will of, of, uh, of a certain nation, of preserving national identities and preserving cultural identities, uh, it doesn't mean that that, that would uh, somehow be abolished or eradicated, and, uh, uh, and we, we still believe that that would be something we, could, we, we would be able to, to preserve also in the future world that uh, my, par my partner was telling you about. Uh, however, uh, it would be much more effective and beneficial for all if political, economic, bureauc bureaucratic powers and, uh, uh, and structures would be in hands of a joint power uh, in, in which all the, all the countries of the Europe are heard equally. Uh, and uh, that would be more efficient, it would, would create better world, and it would be, have more power to endorse and to defend the Euro European values in a, larger, uh, uh, in a larger arena, which are, after all, values with, to all uh, European Union member states, at least nominally, adhere to anyway, at least they have to. And so, uh, before I try to uh, sum up uh, two of the main clash points of this debate, which, in my opinion, are the defense of values and the efficiency of, uh, of, such, of such a pro proportion that, uh, that we are giving you today, uh, I would like to give a short rebuttal regarding the, sp the speeches of the last, uh, of the last speaker. So, uh, the, the main concerns that the last speaker of the team opposition had, uh, had with our proposal was that uh, a joint European policy would be slow, ineffective, and, uh, and it would be the case that in uh, any way everything is decided by huge players such as Germany, France and UK who have more power and from whom everyone else are de dependent upon economically. And, but, but, but what we are saying is that is already the case right now when the foreign, uh, foreign, foreign affairs of the European, opinion are, European Union are somehow split between the, between the, between the sovereign member states and, uh, and also uh, various decisions in, in which uh, all the states have to somehow take into account uh, the, uh, the opinions of other states. Because regarding the most common exam examples that kept uh, emerging up this, this debate, uh, is there a common stance in the Europe regarding what, what should be the Germany's stance regarding the gas supply from Russia? No, there still isn't. Is there a common stance, stance in Europe regarding what should be the actions, actions against the military atrocities uh, performed by Russia recently and so no, there still isn't. Is there, a, a, is there a common agreement on how we should respond to the immigration crisis in the Mediterranean? No, there still isn't. And that is mainly, the, mainly, the, mainly because there is no one common power in which, uh, uh, in, in which uh, there could be an equal rational decision achieved in which all the countries would have, a, would have an e equal say, which is what we propose uh, with the increasing the influence of the European External Affair, Affairs Service and, and that would be something which would, would first decrease, decrease this inequality between the influence uh, and disparity of influence of larger and smaller countries and also uh, 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 therefore in which everyone would, would have a more equal say uh, and also w which would help to, to achieve common decisions because uh, we don't really see that slowness is anything that, uh, that can be uh, as a stone that can be thrown in our garden because as we see it now uh, the uh, effectiveness in, in achieving decisions regarding how we, how we, res, re, we should respond to foreign affairs is, is very slow by now. And for instance, regarding the immigration crisis, as we can see, uh, just the fact that uh, uh, European Union countries still have uh, 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 some sort of uh, sovereign say as to uh, what, what, what should be their position uh, regarding the immigration crisis is actually an obstacle to solve that. And it is an it is an obstacle to uh, any kind of decision. For instance, uh, introducing introducing quotas to all the uh, to, to all the European Union countries and so on. Which which, as we see it, uh, if a more power was given to 
an, an independent all-country representative institution which, uh, which represents the uh, external interests of European Union as a whole, uh, the way we see it, even if it would take, well, uh, some time uh, to, uh, to come to this decision, we, we, we still believe that it would, it would be quite, quite faster uh, in, in this kind of way. Yes, please, Leva. We never said that we are against that, right? I think, and uh, in team proposition, we believe that uh, in, in some way it, it uh, inevitably leads in this direction. However, uh, as we, uh, and mainly because that is uh, pragmatically, politically, economically effective, as, had, as has already been shown regarding other issues, economical issues and, uh, uh, lab, uh, and labor movement issues and climate change issues that cooperation in much larger scale is more effective in solving common issues. And we believe that uh, we should uh, apply, apply this logic also, uh, also to now to the foreign affairs, exactly because there are now quite huge issues regarding the foreign affairs and our relationships with different countries around the world uh, and uh, around the borders of the European Union issues that are really pressing. And as we see it under status quo, we are quite unable to solve them and to re respond to them uh, properly. And therefore, we believe that European values, to which we all adhere anyway, uh, could, be, could be defended more efficiently uh, if, if such a structure as European External Affairs Service would be implemented uh, as a much more, inf influential, more influential organization than it is now. And, uh, and that, would, that would eliminate such, a, uh, as, uh, such events as uh, France having trade agreements uh, regarding the arms and, uh, and military techniques, techniques with Russia because, uh, uh, be because it doesn't really, uh, such an action doesn't really much adhe adhere to the European commitment of, of political justice. Uh, it, 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 it would also, uh, we believe, uh, uh, be more, more effective in, uh, in solving such, a, such, a, such an issue as an immigration crisis, which would adhere to European value of, uh, uh, of uh, every person having a right to, uh, uh, to not, not, being, uh, not being in a state or, uh, or uh, in a position where you live in a constant poverty and war and, uh, and having an ability to pursue your freedoms and, and happiness. And, uh, and, and also regarding efficiency, well, I think the strongest case provided by the team opposition was given by Leva by, by mentioning different, different sorts of examples in which different European Union states have, uh, uh, have different priorities, uh, and that is why we could, we could, if we tried to achieve decisions that are, uh, that are beneficial for everyone equally, we could, never come to, uh, we could never prioritize them and so on. But uh, the key word, uh, to, solve, to solving that is resources, because right now regarding foreign affairs, as they are at least partly independent and sovereign, European uh, Union countries still have to deal on their own. But uh, if, uh, if, the, if the vast economical uh, uh, people, mil uh, cap uh, capital uh, resources of the European, European Union as they are could be put together and uh, could, be, could be put to a more use in their uh, Regarding, regarding a foreign policy that, uh, that has been ag agreed upon in, the, uh, in this common structure, uh, we believe that uh, uh, the, the resources that Europe, ha Europe has would be quite enough to, uh, to first sometimes not being even, uh, for, for it not being even necessary to prioritize and to being, uh, being able to respond to different kinds of issues equally and sim simultaneously. And that is why, so, uh, I think I have quite exceeded, exceeded, the, exceeded my time. So basically, uh, the main idea is that uh, already, already in the past, in the history of European Union, it has been shown quite a lot of times that uh, we can achieve uh, a better world uh, for, for every sovereign country, for every citizen, and also for, uh, for people outside of the European Union, Union by, uh, by cooperation and by achieving uh, uh, common decisions regarding economical, political, social, and, and, uh, and climate change issues. And, uh, and as, as we believe we have shown you, uh, 
this, uh, this same logic would be much more efficient if we, re if, we re if we had more cooperation and more common ground also regarding the foreign affairs is issues of the European Union member states. So I'm glad to propose today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about three things in my speech. I want to talk firstly about what kind of internal conflict such a thing would create, uh, what, which kind of harms will come out of it. Secondly, I will sum up this, uh, this debate with, will actually the things that the proposition team wants, will they actually happen? Short pre preview? No, it won't. And thirdly, I'm going to use an argument that in the same event last year I used, which is being a superpower. I'm so glad I can use, reuse some things. Okay, let's quickly move on to the first one. So, talking about the internal con conflict. The problem we have here is that there are different priorities. Every single country has diff different priorities. Well, it is obvious. Everyone is looking out for themselves, and that's what they should be doing. And that's, that's, that's something that is normal. The proposition uh, here comes and tells us, you know, already we have diversion, already we have superpowers, uh, the big five, uh, the deciding things, uh, etc., etc. But the, the big issue and the big difference between it is, if you have a joint foreign policy, at that mo moment, everything is binding to you. Everything is what you do. Everything is directly affected towards you. Uh, but right now, it's not directly applicable to you you can actually divert from it, which means that you can actually have a say in your, in your own uh, sovereignty and you don't have to go, uh, go on with everything, especially if it's really detrimental uh, towards, uh, towards uh, what your people actually need at that moment. Uh, be it the question of Russia, be it the question of ISIL, be it the question of uh, North Africa, it, it depends on the region. Okay, so the problem is that everyone doesn't see everything the same way. So, what happens now? What, what, what's the problem now? The problem now is that, um, you know, somehow we need to create this common policy under their, uh, their model, and it can be created in two ways. Either one way that basically every country is equal, every country has one vote, which means that a certain group of countries, let's say smaller countries, can literally outvote the bigger countries. Or it's, diver uh, or it's basically the mandate is given by population, for example, which means that the bigger countries have a power over the small countries. So we have a direct conflict here. And we have two direct opposite sides that have completely different goals and objectives in what they want to achieve and how they want to achieve these things. And for example, let's take, uh, let's take the example that Leva brought to you about Kosovo and uh, recognizing their independence. What now happens is, let's say, that you know, the EU decides jointly that we need to do this. This is directly now applicable also to Spain. What happens at the, this point is that Catalonia, for example, gets the precedent. The question here isn't about whether Catalonia should be independent or not. The question is that Catalonia now has a precedent that they can and are now able to do something. They are now able to get their independence to say, uh, basically because Spain has themselves as the EU said that this kind of precedent is now happening, this, this is something that is legitimate, and this is something that we can use. Now, why is this detrimental for the whole union? The problem here is that Spain would probably rather leave the European Union rather than actually, you know, just take it and realize, oh my God, we've been wrong all this time, we should give them independence. That's not likely to happen, actually. So the more likely scenario is, Spain is really proud, will leave, and the European Union will, is in much more danger and its future is in danger because, you know, some countries want to leave because some the policies are just too, too detrimental uh, for them to actually handle and be in the Union. Okay. okay. So this is clear. Second point. Talking about, talking about will the policies that they want to achieve actually happen. As I said, the simple answer is no. I'm going to elaborate on that. So, they had these really ideal, great policies, basically two, three policies that they want to implement through this plan. And basically they're all related to human rights, being a nice person, etc. 
and there is only one problem. It's contingent on one small thing that, we ha that everyone has this one idea and everyone has this one understanding that this is good and this is bad. The problem is that the world isn't black and white. There is a big, big gray area and many, many of these countries and many people actually have different ideas what is important. For example, be it, for example, uh, well, Russia has been really, really popular today. Let's talk about that, for example. So, the thing is, with this case, for example, is that, um, let's say, like, like the big five uh, gets the majority vote and they basically decide. Well, let's say that Germany gets, gets this power as they are, uh, as well, most of Europe's economy is contingent on them. So, what, what now happens is that, uh, they basically decide what is most important for them. They will decide upon the matter that, okay, right now, economically, now this is just so bad, we shouldn't do this policy. We need, for example, raw materials, energy, whatever, from Russia. Let's, let's, give, let's, let's just give, it, give them a bit, a bit of room. This, now, this is something that will probably be pretty bad for human rights, this is probably pretty bad for everyone else, except for this Blake Block who decided that, uh, that this is right now in their best interest. Not right now. Um, and let, especially, for example, the Eastern Bloc, this is pr probably a pretty bad thing if, if, if the whole EU policy would be that, you know, in the question of Ukraine, ah, let us, let's let it slide. Even if, even if, let's say that the EU as a joint organization will have a moral compass that is just extremely, uh, extremely, extremely brilliant, then they didn't show us any way in how, in, under their policy, actually, things would change now. That giving a note to Russia, for example, would change actually anything. Or how actually the you know, economic sanctions Many, uh, we've implemented to many countries in the world uh, that have actually never really worked as a foreign policy tool. How can these things actually change anything and create these human rights differences that we want to achieve? So the question is, why should we take such a huge risk if we don't know the certain outcome and the certain benefits of it? Why take such a risk which is the stability of our own union and our own actually, uh, actual, you know, uh, uh, well-being and benefits. That's it. Okay, third and final point. I'll make it quickly because my time is, uh, time is a bit, bit, bit uh, long, yeah. Okay, being a superpower. Okay, firstly, like, as the previous, uh, previous speakers have already said, like, a joint foreign policy makes us actually weaker. It doesn't make us a superpower. It, uh, and I'm gonna explain to you now why. Like, a joint, a joint foreign policy actually doesn't really matter that much as to being what one of their goals is uh, the, in proposition to be a superpower. It might help, it might hinge, and this, in this case, actually not having a joint foreign policy is something that benefits us, uh, benefits us much more. Like, the, the ability that we would have, basically the biggest ability to sanction some countries and have a bit more power isn't that big of a power, actually, and that does not create us a superpower. What creates us a superpower is if we have a strong economic union by using the benefits of all its member states, of all the st uh, strengths of these uh, uh, member st states, and actually having a different foreign policy for every single country helps us achieving those things because of basically three reasons. First of all, quick responsiveness uh, in dealing with reg regional problems, which is always a pretty good thing to have. You know, quick response is usually better than a long response. Uh, second of all, is that no other, country, no other superpower can address this union as a whole, actually. They can ad address us as individuals, which, which means that actually you cannot force the whole, uh, you cannot force some regions into doing something you have to actually get an agreement with them, which means that we have more power to actually negotiate in that sense. And, and third of all, which is the most important thing, 
we, have, we can implement specialist foreign policies depending on the region. That means that the region that is most affected by it is actually in charge of what kind of policy will be implemented in that region, which means that we actually get the best possible solution uh, for the whole union as all of the regions will be stronger by it. And for these reasons, I beg you to oppose. Thank you. Thank you, Erwin. I hope you enjoyed the debate. I just want to stress out that uh, the opinions presented in the speeches do not align necessarily with those held by the individuals. So we were basically giving you the arguments without necessarily being in a full belief of that. Uh, perhaps some of you have any opinions that you want to voice out now for the debate? Yes, there are some. <laughs> Thank you. I think the point that the last speaker made was actually the most convincing argument that the theory might be all very well, but in practice, how are you going to do this? You're absolutely right. Spain would rather leave the European Union than give up Catalan. Um, we're all aware of the UK's position on a referendum, and that's even before we get to this issue. This is just on the status quo of the European Union, and I'm sure there'd be many other countries that would leave rather than uh, make their foreign policy subservient to the EAS. But I thought it was an excellent debate. Well done, all of you. I'd also like to thank you for the debate. My name is Valdis Leopinch. Um, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, as always. I don't think you can have a full EU foreign policy, but you can certainly have a foreign policy on certain issues that are uh, joint values for, the, for all the countries together. Um, so I think the debate should really, or could have been, one as to how can we arrive at the best compromise, and it's not a popular word, but that's what we'll be talking about. But my main, uh, I, I have a real objection to the way you proposed national interests. I think you called them selfish interests. Now, selfish means doing something or taking something at somebody else's expense. Now, if we want to defend the Baltic countries against Russia, are we taking something from somebody in Spain or France or the Netherlands? Could you answer that? Okay, I believe then I can give the word to the organizers and thank all the participants for the debate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much indeed. Uh, I thought you would respond, but perhaps during the coffee break, since we are already behind the schedule a little bit, so please uh, uh, join us outside for a 15 minutes uh, coffee break, and please come back in 15 minutes uh, for a wonderful, promising event next on our schedule.